Great, thank you. Um, all right, well, welcome all the folks who are giving us their time. We really appreciate you spending some time with us today. And thanks to uh, Tal and the PMWC folks who have really helped us pull together um, a great, great panel here today. Um, I'm really going to walk through a couple of slides first just to set context and then have the rest of the team kind of walk through introductions themselves. But this is, for those who want to make sure they're in the right place, the data curation, integration, and visualization session uh, today. And we look forward, we're going to leave some time at the end for questions because we love to get some engagement from the audience. It's an important topic that I think we're all, we're all struggling with. Let me see if I can make sure I've got the thing working. Great. All right. Well, many have seen this slide. I think are slides like this one, basically depicting population genomics projects at scale. And yes, they are huge. There are a lot of them, and there are more coming. Um, we predict probably about and are analyzing probably like 50 of these population sequencing and genomics projects out there in the world, whether you look at France or Singapore, Israel, others. Genomics England just finished their 100,000. You've got all of us just kind of launching out now. Um, Regeneron, who's been here with uh, the UK Biobank discussion, and talking about that, you know, they're, they're going to probably get done with about all 500,000 of those this year and are already delivering on that. And then, of course, AstraZeneca, who had the big announcement a year and a half ago, two years ago, of the 2 million cohort, they are significantly advancing that and moving as fast as they can. We at DNA Nexus are working on um, all of these projects, which is great, but it does show, again, the value of building tools and solutions that can actually help them scale and integrate different types of disparate data sets. That's not the only issue that's going on. The consumer side has been immense. It's the, the, the actual movement on the consumer side, to me, has been pretty amazing to watch over the last couple of years. And it's not just the consumer genomics piece, but it's actually a lot of uh, innovative organizations that are strong, starting to discuss in public with the consumer the aspect of owning your data. Companies like Luna, um, who are spending a heck of a lot of time helping educate uh, individuals and building platforms to be able to kind of integrate together the ability to own your own data. Um, and you know, consent with that is obviously quite a big issue. But that is a piece that we need to make sure we can try and advance and fix when we're talking about data curation and integration. Also, you have a lot of different types of, of uh, models with this that are moving forward to ultimately creating this problem. It's not just a research problem, it's also a clinical problem. So when, from a research perspective, you have all these disparate data sets, you're trying to do a research program, you're running into collaboration issues, and yet on a clinical side, you have all this different data that's coming in relative to a 15-minute encounter. You have, again, like consumers getting testing that they don't even fully know exactly what that means, nor do they understand how it's going to drive better decisions for them clinically, and a doctor trying to make that decision becomes very, very challenging when you have all those different types of pieces of data that you're trying to analyze. So. It is really a very complex, variable, and massive issue, but it is not just about genomics. And I always like to bring this up, and I like to reiterate it uh, multiple times. Genomics is a key pillar and will advance uh, science and advance research and advance medicine significantly, as we have already seen. It is not the only pillar. And when you start to incorporate clinical, real-world data, image, other multiomics type data, you can see exponential value of improving and accelerating research and discovery but it's a very, very difficult thing to do. And it's something that we've been really talking about in the field. There is really kind of this new era of technologies and tools and platforms and databases arising to help scale this and help really kind of move this forward in a very accelerated fashion. We at DNA Nexus, and this is not an advertisement for DNA Nexus uh, at all, I don't like it actually when people do that in these conferences, but I do want to talk to you about one of the things that I've always liked and always you know, talked to Tal about is giving examples of solutions that are having success in the space. We did last year build a, a, a what's called an Apollo translational informatics platform. We did that with pharma companies and medical centers over the last two and a half years because they were struggling with this data curation integration problem. So we took pieces and lots of different types of technologies and tools and brought them together in a very usable um, uh, format to, again, advance science and research. Um, 
the basis of this is really unifying the clinical and, and, and genomics data. It's really trying to look at ways that you can share and collaborate around projects. And this is really what we're going to talk about today uh, with this panel. So I wanted to make sure to introduce um, Mike Cherry, who is the professor of genetics at Stanford, uh, Yuri uh, Hung, who is the senior director of genomics at Ancestry.com, and Benedict uh, Patton, who is the associate director of the Genomics Institute for UCSC. I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves, spend just a couple of minutes talking about what they do, what their struggles are, and then I'm going to walk into more of an actual kind of question-answer uh, period and leave some time for, for some questions for the audience. So, um, Mike? Mike? I don't know. I think you might have said you had a slide. Um, I'll just show the first one. Go ahead. You can say load it. Load so, it. my group at Stanford does curation, uh, curation of small data and big data as well. Um, what the slide will show you is just there's lots and lots of data published every year from many different individuals, different laboratories, using different methods, using different assays uh, to get there. The results, the conclusions come out um, to, to say something, but a researcher can get to that conclusion using a different assay, using a different uh, uh, methodology, biological samples, different chemistry uh, involved in that. So when we're curating to understand what the result was, we also want to be able to create the metadata about that, about that result as well. And so this continues on from just this um, idea here of, of looking at little data. My group has read 90,000 papers to deal with the uh, information coming from the budding yeast, uh, Saccharomyces cerevis, yeah. But we're also involved with creating the metadata for large data sets. So it's not just curating data. I mean, curating the metadata is the most important thing. You want to know you know, what was the genotype of the individual, the human cells, uh, um, about it? Where, what's tissue did it come from? Um, great. Yuri? I'm Yuri Hong. I'm the Senior Director of Genomics at Ancestry DNA. I run the R&D team at Ancestry DNA, where the scientists are involved in integrating genomic information, user-submitted content in the form of pedigrees and family trees, um, and our immense record collection in order to um, develop products for our consumers. You know, there's been a lot of talk here about <clears throat> uh, con direct to consumer genomics, um, and part of it is really trying to identify what is it that is in engaging to our customers. Um, and so, as during that process of integrating really diverse data types and big data types, um, what we struggle with is trying to identify how the data are interoperable, how do you have a uniform language to then integrate this data, um, and then what are the questions that make sense from being asked of this data. Um, as we're you know, in the world of machine learning and AI, one of the real big challenges I see in the, in the space is really understanding the data sets you're using. Um, and how do you know that you have the right data for the right question that you want to ask? Benedict. <clears throat> yeah, hi. I'm Benedict. Um, I'm a, 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 a sorry, junior faculty at UC Santa Cruz and associate director of the Genomics Institute. And um, in amongst the things my lab does, over the last couple of years, we've taken on a large number of sort of data management uh, challenges. So we're um, attempting to create a cloud-first platform for the Human Cell Atlas Project. Um, and now for uh, NHLBI, which manages the TopMed project, uh, and NHGRI's ANVIL project. Um, and so through this, we're, uh, we're trying to sort of integrate uh, many different data modalities. But a key kind of theme of our lab has been sort of, sort of managing the shift of researchers into cloud environments, because all of the data sets that we're managing are far too big for uh, us to kind of persist with the download model in which people essentially come to um, a shopping cart-like app and then choose data and download it. It just doesn't work anymore. And so we have kind of started to create an ecosystem um, with collaborators to allow people to essentially um, come into an, a fully integrated platform in which they can perform their analysis in situ and get their results and, uh, uh, you know, and visualizations and so forth. So we're sort of trying to build a complete ecosystem in which uh, people have access to data, can compute on data, and we recognize the needs of, of many different types of users, from people who want to just visualize data, who want to get a quick answer, uh, to people who want to perform a more in-depth uh, analysis, you know, bioinformaticians and, and uh, sort of uh, computational folks. 
Um, and in that process, we have to work both with submitting labs that are creating data, um, which is complex, that has many different kind of descriptions, um, and then sort of fit that into a model in which uh, people who are consuming that data can then kind of relate to it and use it in an intelligent way. And cre creating that interface is really the key of the challenge that we're in engaged in. Great, thanks. So you can see we've got a great uh, group up here, uh, two really from research, although um, Yuri is also research, but um, I guess converted to industry, um, but still has that nice research piece uh, backing her up. Um, so we have, we have a, a group of folks that really understand these issues, these problems, are working with this every day. They're kind of playing with this uh, within the real world. Um, I'm going to start with, with Mike and, and kind of walk down some of the data curation paths. So, you know, data curation is obviously a critical component to the data chain of, you know, we'll call it provenance of data. Can you talk a little bit about um, the curation of data um, and some of the inherent problems that you have seen and worked with from a research perspective and some of the things that you're doing to help, you know, ultimately get to an answer, to, to, to more rapidly get to discovery? So, it, <clears throat> so it's, it's interesting. A lot of the problem is really that there's not been a lot of standards or that labs haven't felt compelled to, to, to apply to the standards, apply the standards. So, you know, they publish a paper, the paper's published, they're, they're done, right? Well, of course, more and more you have to make the data available. Making that file available is fine, but they need to actually associate the metadata with it. So it's really about, I think, convincing the community that A, there are standards and that they need to use the standards. Uh, you know, it, it shouldn't be something they made up. That's not a standard. There are standards out there. Standard ontologies, standard vocabularies, uh, all these things together. Um, I mean, the easy example, which we all understand, is, is like an anatomy, you know, uh, or, or a, cell, a cell line. If you say a cell line is A and I say a cell line is B, do I know they're the same, you know, or not? And they may be the same. But it, so it's, it's sort of just applying standards. Okay. Um, yeah, Gary, you, we, we were talking uh, the other day uh, about the data issue and the need for kind of biological meaningful results. Again, kind of following on with um, uh, what Mike is saying, you know, to get to biological meaningful results, obviously there's going to be the need to have the data that it, people believe and trust and, and understand that they're kind of working on similar data sets, or at least a data set that they know is valuable and, 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 and actionable. How, how are you dealing with the kind of biological, uh, meaningful results piece of, of data acquisition and, and use? Yeah, I think one of the things, you know, like Mike said, what is the data set you're looking at? You know, it's not, it's not just reading a paper, looking at a few gels anymore, saying like, oh yeah, I believe the, those results. It's looking at immense, quantities of data from diverse sources and trying to quickly assess whether or not you have the right question, um, the right data set for the right question that you're, you're trying to answer. Um, and how do you, how do, you uh, do the data cleaning in order to figure out whether you have um, an, a data set that can be integrated together? Are there any biases in your data? Um, that your methods, uh, you know, could be just highlighting. Um, and so, how, you know, making sure that the scientists themselves have a good understanding of how to um, investigate the data sets you're getting and understanding how they were created. Um, you know, if you're getting two genomic data sets, what platforms were they run on? How were the data analyzed? You know, which variant calling method was used? Um, what are the biases that are inherent in that? And just knowing what the good questions are to understand the data that you're looking at. Yeah, and just to follow on on that, how, how do you do that? Because you're bringing up some really good points. It's interesting in this space, having worked with a lot of pharma companies that are doing a lot of their own sequencing, but also getting a lot of that done outside of that with maybe a sequence service provider partner. Let's say they're doing their own sequencing and they have their own pipeline and they're getting a result. Let's say they're getting sequencing done from a partner and bringing in that data. And even if it's on the same pipeline, but it's on an instrument that's in a different facility in a different part of the world, they're still seeing different results sometimes. And so, you know, how, how, how are you guys in dealing with this? Because you do so much of this at scale with sequencing on the consumer side. And then you have so much data that you're, you're able to access. Um, how are you able to kind of know that or educate your teams and folks that are building those assets to be able to get to results and get to, you know, the information that ultimately a consumer may kind of make a decision around or may look at that data and, and do something with? 
How are you pulling that together? Yeah, one of the things is asking our scientists to really when they are you know, looking at public data sets, try to get the metadata. What were the methods um, that were used? And is that going, how is that going to work in the algorithms we're developing with the data sets we're currently working on? Um, and what, one, of, one of the things that we have asked for is, you know, a lot of the gold standard data, um, uh, gold standard data sets out there, can they run their pipelines against, you know, some of um, the genome in a bottle samples and then uh, do yeah. some analysis. So you have a consistent um, data set across multiple platforms that you can then compare against. And I think, you know, this concept of a gold standard uh, can be tricky, but in the absence of a gold standard, what are various types of concordance uh, data methods that you can look at and how do you how do you evaluate that so it sounds like you're really kind of pitching this um, strong data governance data hygiene whether you're using which there are standards out there but again a lot of people there are multiple different types of standards even with the clinical data side of things you've got you know snowmed and you got OMOP you got all these different types of ontologies and things that people can use but with this it, it, to me it seems like I'm hearing you say it's not just one way I mean it would be nice to have the data across but inside of your own organization, focus on ways that you can create better data governance, better data hygiene by understanding the metadata, understanding the methods that are being used to make sure that that's being served up appropriately. Yeah, and even if there are ontologies and you know, standardized language really helps, but even, even when that is present, you don't want to just blindly assume that everything underlying it is good. Great. Uh, Benedict, staying kind of on the ontologies, semantics discussion for a moment, let's uh, discuss data sets that are used and shared by many folks. Um, it sounds like with the work that you're doing, which is magnificent, you know, bringing the cloud is important. You mentioned it multiple times. I know in a call that we had earlier in the week, we also talked about this and the importance of cloud from not only a collaboration perspective you know, to be able to enable that, but um, also to be able to get tools and access tools and maybe use tools in more of a kind of shared capacity, it enables that. Very really hard to do that within an HPC behind your own firewalls, much more difficult. And now the cloud is really sitting there that is much more secure and compliant than I think it has been in the past. I know it's a big focus of ours. How are you kind of dealing with that with your projects and a multitude of researchers that you want to come in and kind of help accelerate a project or accelerate a discovery within that environment? Yeah, well, let me, let me give a couple of different perspectives. So firstly, within the Human Cell Atlas project, um, we're very much, we, we, we started with the data platform before the data was being generated. And in that project, we nice. were able to start with a kind of evolving metadata schema in which we have a, a, a model in which we have uh, real people, da data brokers, who essentially work with submitting labs to develop um, sort of organically the appropriate schema in a way that sort of, you know, there are many answers to the way, there are a million possible ways to do it but we're trying to arrive at one possible uh, you know, sort of fix on the standard that everybody can comply with, at least a, sort of a minimal set of terms. And that's quite nice because uh, when, you, when you do that, you can kind of go through a conversation with the submitting labs and find out and work out, oh, these are the terms of art that are really relevant to us. These are the things that we really feel this one postdoc you know, recognized that we really needed to collect. And if we hadn't done it that way around, then we probably would have realized after the fact that we were missing certain things that we you know, just didn't right. collect because we were too rigid. Um, but then in other projects, so for, for NHLBI, running the data stage project with TopMed, we're in a very different uh, situation in which that data is already mostly generated and generated across dozens of different cohorts and all done very independently. And in that case, we can't go back and say, can you please resubmit all your data and reformat for <laughs> you? It's no. not gonna happen. So in that case, um, with collaborator, collaborators over at Vanderbilt, we're taking um, a much more kind of, uh, as, as previous speakers were saying, kind of ontology harmonization approach where we're saying, well, we have some stuff that's expressed in SOMEB, but we really want things in OMOP, so we're doing a kind of on-the-fly translation. We have a bunch of unstructured text stuff. Can we figure out some NLP methods that we can do to sort of try to sort of pull stuff into a standard uh, schema? Um, so there's a sort of, you can kind of, you can attempt after the fact to try to pull things together and try to do your harmonization, but it is, um, I would say less preferable to the kind of uh, let's, the, the more organic model that starts out with a, a, a minimal model of the metadata and kind of lets it evolve yeah. um, forwards. And then just on the method side, I think it's really important to mention 
that we are entering an age, yes, of big data in which uh, data wants to sit resident in the cloud, but we're also entering a world in which data sets are, are big enough that you can't possibly hope to analyze all your data in one cloud environment. And therefore, methods need to travel, right? We need to be able to take methods to data. And therefore, we are increasingly uh, in a world where we need to be able to describe workflows and tools in a standardized way. And we've seen the emergence of standards like common workflow language and workflow description language and various forms of, of, of containers, Docker containers, et cetera, that allow us to do that. And so uh, my group has been developing this thing called docstore.org. There are others around. Um, but this idea of being able to, to essentially standardize the metadata and curation around tooling is actually really important. And I think it's going to allow us to get to a much more reproducible place, even though we have to do our analysis across perhaps four different computing centers. Yeah, that's really interesting because it, it, it is important on the tools side that one of the things that you know, we've realized in some of the work that we've been doing with organizations like St. Jude, where you pull together all of this very valuable data, you know, it's the largest pediatric genomics data set with clinical data available to researchers to date that I know of. Um, but once you have the data, that's great. But if you don't have tools available for researchers to use, which they develop some of their own, or an environment to bring tools in easily, because they all researchers have their own favorites, of course. it becomes much more difficult. So the data curation and integration problem isn't just necessarily on the actual data itself. It's the environment that you're building to enable it, too. So it's, I mean, just having the regular ontology of how do you bring a tool in. How do you make that easy? If I have a research tool that I want to bring to the data, you have to enable that and make that yeah. easy. It seems like that's something that you guys I, I think it's beholden on us as, yeah. as data curators and uh, sort of cre creators of these environments to allow a certain amount of interoperability. So whether or not you're on DNA Nexus with St. Jude's or you're using NIH's whatever, yeah. uh, you can perform the same methods and, and aggregate results. Totally agree with that. that, that that's great. Um, okay, so let's, let's um, kind of shift maybe the discussion on, on the tools side. I'm gonna bring up a discussion that everybody seems to be talking about, but yet I'm just not sure where there's a, there's a full there there yet. There's a lot of great examples of work around machine learning and AI that has been, I think, very impressive over the last few years. And uh, to use somebody else's term, I won't say who, but there might also be a bit of hubris around this um, uh, in, in this area too. But I did wanna bring it up in this because you know, if you're analyzing data and you're utilizing machine learning and AI, which could be extremely advantageous if done right, doesn't it have to be done on qual high quality data? Isn't it the same kind of thing that, again, whatever reporting you're getting out, if it's on poor data that's not well governed or not, it doesn't have good hygiene, it's still going to be very problematic. It's not going to fix that problem that we know of today. So I just wanted to get some input on the team. When we think about tools, and you think about a platform integrating different data sets and now building tools on top of it to kind of do some really good investigation and research, what is the sense of how you can plug machine learning, AI, and possibly even some you know, NLP tooling, which is more on the, I'd call it, on the baseline to get the data governed. But um, I'd l love your input on that. Mike? So, so as has been said several times here, you, you need a gold standard or a reference map. A lot of these maps are relatively high order uh, with the uh, ENCODE project. We have lots and lots of maps, a lot of data type, but they're, they're, they're not getting at the point of the regulation of who's binding where, when, and why. They're getting at, at binding sites across the genome, for example, involved with regulation. Well, if you don't understand what that, that regulatory element is, is and who's binding to it, how can you necessarily best associate that with the expression of a gene? Mm. You can make inferences. But I mean, even, um, you know, regulation, the language of regulation is 30 years old. You know, we have a small number of elements that, that are being right. talked about. So you, you have to curate things. Now, when I say curate, I mean, you know, manually expert curated. So you can, you can really give a solid, you know, base level information that then the machine learners can use. And I mean, I thought it was really um, quite shocking uh, almost last week at a conference and a very notable bright guy at Stanford, uh, machine learner, was encouraging people to get involved in a little uh, organic uh, project to do some manual curation so that his work could be better. Um, so, you know, I mean, it was, it was really great to see that, the, that, okay, he doesn't believe he's gonna solve the world's problem with AI. Right. He probably could, but he needs better, uh, better core data as well. Great, thank you. You have any comments? Yeah, absolutely. So. One, you know, the whole tenet of machine learning and AI, you know, we've, talk, we've been hearing here is 
basically it comes down to garbage in, garbage out. You know, if you don't have a good quality data set that you can train your models on, you can do your cross-validation on, how you can evaluate and interpret your results on, know that you're getting high quality information out of it, you don't know if that is actually answering the question that you want to answer. Um, and so a well-curated data set can provide the appropriate la labels to do your training, or it can help you interpret the results that you're getting. Um, earlier this morning, Andrew, um, Carol talked about uh, the deep variant tool um, uh, for variant calling, and one of the things that they realized um, one of the differences was whether or not that NGS uh, result had been um, you had been done using a PCR free or a PCR based uh, sequencing method. And so, mm -hmm. if you didn't know that about the data set, you may have thought that the variant wasn't performing as well. But when you're able to understand what is the feature that is contributing to that result then you can try to train your models better. Um, and so this is where really the power of curated data um, is often overlooked and is part of the good hygiene of when you're doing a computational assay. Benedict, <coughs> love your input too. Yeah, no, um, I, I think that's a, a really great example. I mean, I just say, I know we, we, we say we live in this age of big data, but we're still in a world in which um, the questions we could ask and the dimensionality of the human genome and all of the different myriad downstream assays is so so large that we're mostly the end, the number of samples we have to compare is just not sufficient. And so we do need to subset our questions and subset um, our approaches, and that requires metadata. You can't, you know, in a, in, a, in a world in which you have sort of infinite data, yeah, sure, we can imagine unsupervised approaches to make discoveries, but the world in which we live in is still uh, very much constrained uh, by the number of observations, by the size of the population. And so I think it's absolutely vital that we're able to um, you know, have, discover those confounding variables. And uh, without, without it, sure, you can imagine approaches which might figure out, oh, this looks like it has a signature of being PCR-free or not. Um, but that's an extra step that doesn't need to happen and that also doesn't aid interpretability, which is, I think, really key um, as we sort of move forward, that we have interpretable models. That's great. Um, I know this is, might be a little bit uh, off topic, but it reminded me of, of, while you guys were talking about this, of something that, um, you know, we're producing, we always talk about this, like we're producing more data, more data, more data. It's just constantly coming. More consumers are buying kits. More sequencing is being done by pharma, like, we, uh, like I explained earlier. But there is a lot of historical data that still exists. The research projects that were done historically, that yes, there was some sequencing done on it, panels, other types of stuff, before it became really cost effective to do whole exome and ultimately will to do whole genome sequencing. But there are a lot of projects. And I was reading, I think it was either today or yesterday, that the GA4GH, uh, the data use ontology, they are incubating the standard that algorithmically will match the permissible or consented uses of patient and participant data sets because they really want to be able to kind of look at determining which subset for an institution from an archived study perspective are available. And this is now available for public to kind of give public comments on how they're building this. I just found that kind of interesting. And the reason why I wanted to bring it up, and I know it's not exactly on, 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 on this topic, but it is in the sense of if there is good historical data to access it, from curating that and bringing that into to the environment, how would you guys suggest both, especially the, the all you, with your history of research, do you find that um, valuable? I mean, is, is that historical data, if it's good data, does it continue to stand up as, as, as valuable data to use? Do we need to continue to produce all the immense amount of data that we have now and not look historically, I guess is what I'm asking. We still need more data. The technology is getting better, reads are getting longer, deeper. Um, you know, you've got to be doing that to get better answers. But, but the historic data is so important because I know one project that we were involved with picking up moving forward was uh, the metadata wasn't quite as good as we needed it to be today. And we spent about a year to uh, uh, revive it. That's saying it too well, too uh, uh, severely. But to, to move it up to sort of modern standards. So if you don't have that, I mean, I'm not sure how you could take historical data, uh, metadata, and actually move it up in, in many cases. It really involved a year's worth of work for us to do that. But once we did, let's say 80% of that data is now still in use. It's 10-year-old data. The people enjoy it. 
enjoy it. People want it because it uses uh, particular tissue types that aren't, aren't well available, uh, right. commonly available things. So that, that's critical. You can't find that person again, right? And so if you don't have the data, you just don't have the data at all. But you need to be able to find it. Okay. And so, you know, that's, that's the critical part. You, metadata on the tissue, metadata on the, on the pipelines uh, is all very important. You guys, any comments on? How on? old is old? Good question. Yeah. I mean, what, what would you, what, what, what do you feel is valuable or, or, or do you guys historically try and find other data as you're doing projects to compare to certain data that you maybe are creating? Yeah, I, I think part of it goes down to what, what is a question you want to answer and are there existing data sets from, you know, old 10 year old, 15 year old projects that would be worth than uh, promoting into current standards. Yeah. But it, for me, it's at least, you know, what it, does it help complement the existing data sets? It, I think that's a perfect uh, term that I was looking for, the complementing existing data sets, because it almost seems like the cost of producing the data, at least doing some of the sequencing, uh, if you have samples available to do it, may be easier than trying to make the historical data more usable and valuable and incorporated in. So that's why there's going to be people producing more data. It's just saying, well, we can get 1,000 people with this maybe condition and produce that data as opposed to try and look historically for that data. Uh, I would say that adding omics, I mean, in some senses, the omics is the easy data. It's a lot more standardized. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're dealing with humans who have human lifespans and you're dealing with you know, prospective um, you know, long-term, longer, longitudinal cohorts, um, that data is extremely valuable and uh, often takes decades to gather. And of course, you know, I don't see the value of that going away anytime soon. We will certainly, you know, probably for the majority of uh, many of the cohorts in dbGaP, we will add whole genome data, we're already doing that, um, to, to them. And that will you know, upgrade and up, update the standard information that we have available on the genomic side. But all of the, the sort of clinical data around those uh, individuals and the co cohorts is, is gold. Uh, and will be accessed for a long, long time to come and makes the data valuable. Great. So I think it's kind of essential. Oh, just You mentioned uh, the, the DUOS, the, the data use mm -hmm. ontology. It's something that we're piloting within uh, the NH LBI and NHGRI projects. Um, and really, it is about trying to match researchers' desired use cases. So I want to study diabetes on blah, 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 with you know, sort of essentially trying to uh, algorithmically figure out what is the largest meta cohort that somebody can actually access to do that work? And so it is actually about trying to make the data that we have latent uh, maximally useful. And I think that's just a really valuable way of kind of approaching it. things. Because if you've got this kind of inertial barrier of totally. saying, well, that data sounds cool, but it will take me forever to go through all the DB gap permissions, then you, you really, you know, you're chilling the research community. And it's important that we, we find ways to make that process much more fluid and, and while still respecting and, and ensuring privacy. Yeah, thanks for, for elaborating on that. I, I found it really, I read it quickly, but I found it to be potentially very valuable. It seems mm -hmm. like it's still early and we'll get some, you know, um, um, yep. you know, some people in the market kind of pushing it forward and looking at it and giving there, guidance back. There's but a real clinical like really trial valuable. to actually establish that mm -hmm. we, in an automated process, can match research data use. So essentially match the uh, process that a DAC normally goes through, which is a human uh, staffed uh, organization in which uh, data access requests are made. So we're really you know, doing it very carefully to make sure that uh, we can produce something computationally that is at least as good. It doesn't actually remove the DAC itself, it just makes the work of the DAC much simpler and much more streamlined um, so that you get more, essentially, more data uh, grant, granted and accessed. Uh, Great. Yeah. So let's move into uh, maybe a little bit on the integration and kind of visualization side. Um, on the integration side, obviously it's really, I think, um, especially difficult when you're talking about clinical healthcare or clinical practice um, if you don't uh, mention data integration, scalability, security, um, and, and kind of privacy issues. So integration of disparate data within clinical hospitals, scenarios, even academic research organizations. It's somewhat challenging. Can you, like, maybe uh, start with you, Mike, and, and, and go down? And it's a little bit different for Yuri now with um, Ancestry DNA. But there are these aspects that to bring the data together from different areas, the integration of that into an ecosystem is still a little bit challenging. Do you deal with having to go through kind of your IT departments? Do you have your own staff that helps you kind of pull the, pull the data together from an integration perspective? Or how are, how are you managing that? Is it just somebody else does it and it magically shows up for you as a researcher? 
So, <clears throat> so the, the, the project has the, the biggest amount of data that we deal with is this INCO project. And I guess I'm lucky in the sense that it seems to have some of the highest standards, for better or worse highest. So then when we bring in a, a, a new data set, a new experimental uh, uh, system, you know, there may be 60,000 files, but we can apply somewhat automatically the very standards that uh, um, would apply to the data itself, like number of reads, okay. uh, depth, uh, uh, did they actually do a good metadata or not. If everything passed, that's the easy part. Things that don't pass, we have, to, we have to look at it to decide, okay, it was just a little error here or there. It was a translation of one ontology to another mm -hmm. or something like that. But it, so it becomes you know, uh, quite a manual process. And then that gets to how valuable the data is to be added to our other data. Does it give it you know, a, a nice complement? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it can be a lot of effort. Uh, it's not, I mean, uh, our ID department, IT department is, a, is us. So, okay. So we're doing it. Yeah, and that's, I get that sense a lot with um, organizations like yours or large, you know, these academic research organizations or when you get involved in these projects, a lot of time you are not only the person kind of identifying what data you want, you're also the person actually doing the work to curate the data and bring it into an environment that you're going to be using. So, what, uh, so on that note, for anyone on the panel, um, you know, there are organizations, large ones like AWS, who are kind of building some tools um, and, and infrastructure, the most recent one they came out with uh, in kind of conjunction with uh, Fred Hutch and I think another institution, kind of helping to look at ways that they can go into the EMR and pull out you know, better elements of data in a more rapid, accelerated, you know, controlled data governance uh, fashion. I think, again, it's, it's, it's early. Are you guys using any kind of big tools like that? I know you mentioned, Benedict, you're using some NLP and some other stuff. Do you build those or do you partner with those? So like, how, what is your build versus partner uh, kind of mindset? Uh, well, so for us, um, we are, we're taking, we're very much sort of focused on the cloud. So none of the environments that we're producing now are on-prem. We're not managing our own machines. Uh, and so, you know, right at the beginning of the process, we're, you know, I, I don't have sysadmins in my group anymore. We have a lot of DevOps engineers who are used to configuring these systems, but they're sort of one tier above uh, where they used to be in terms of managing machines and so forth. So that's the first thing. Um, in terms of services, I think each of the clouds actually provides some really interesting uh, propositions. So obviously, you know, Google, for example, offers a whole bunch of interesting big table um, query interfaces and so forth that allow you to mine your data if you, uh, if you appropriately put it into the right uh, tabular formats and so forth. And there, uh, we absolutely are using those systems and allowing that to power the indexes and, and, and services that we provide. But I think we're definitely moving towards a world in which essentially it's a bunch of microservices. So it may be that you're on a particular cloud environment. We provide a basal layer of what well, we're basically managing access to the data and, and uh, governing, essentially governing and auditing what users are doing. But we want a world in which actually there are many other value add services that could be provided by commercial, could be right. provided by the cloud itself, et cetera. I think that's actually a much better place to be because it doesn't create a sort of monopoly situation for anybody. Um, and uh, it sort of allows us to do what we do best, which is really just try to manage the data on behalf of, that's a really the role that we, we see ourselves playing, managing the data on behalf of you know, the institutes um, that are trusting us with that data. That's great. That's really helpful. And I think, again, for the audience, just one of those, I, I've, I've done these enough where I hear this enough as well, you know, finding the right partnerships, using existing potential tools that are in the marketplace that can advance. It's really hard to kind of, I think for you guys, it, 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 it takes so much time to just find the data and access the data. If that can be faster and you can do the work that you want to do around research, that's what we want. So that's a, that's a really, really great point. I know we're kind of running low on time and I want to have a couple questions, but I did want to get to kind of one aspect of visualization. Um, we didn't touch on it too much. I, I think all of us up here believe, and it's probably another 45 minute session we could do alone on visualization, but I almost equate visualization to education. Visualization is a very important piece related to both researchers and the public, the consumer. Um, Yuri, you and I were talking earlier about the, the, some of the work that you guys do in Ancestry DNA to you know, help educate the consumers of what they're getting. Well, that's a, that's a pretty important visualization aspect. And I'd love you to kind of touch on that because I thought it was really, really important what we were, were talking about earlier. I think visualization, the visualization of the data um, can convey so much information in a small amount of space. Um, and I think that's, that's where we need to get as we're trying to understand, you know, if you're trying to understand the data set that 
you're, you want to consume or you, know, want, you want to integrate. Um, are there visualization tools out there that can help you understand the distribution of the data you have? Um, what does it actually look like? But then also as you're trying to communicate pretty sophisticated statistical me methods or the results of you know, an AI uh, method, like how do you communicate those results to a non-scientific public in a way that they really understand that it is not a yes, no, there's this answer and there's confidence range around it. Um, and I think you know, this, that's where visualization can play a really, really big role. So not just on the consumer of being able to identify or understand even what the data is telling them, but also from a researcher perspective of helping to make connections too and faster. Yeah, we've seen that a lot. I mean, I think getting good visualization people working on your platforms and tools to help build those up, that goes back to bringing in the tools on top of the data becomes really, uh, really important. Well, um, we just with uh, kind of maybe 30 seconds each, one minute each, you know, if there's anything around data curation, integration, visualization that you would want to make sure that the audience kind of walks away with, you know, Mike, what are, what are the main things that you're, you, you'd like, uh, like to leave behind? There's a whole community that knows how to do this well. It's a little bit expensive because you need trained people, but it's so important to keep your data with a long life. Yuri. Don't undervalue um, the lasting impact that good data hygiene can have. <laughs> Benedict. Um, <clears throat> I guess, uh, I guess this, this adventure of this move into the cloud is, is kind of exciting and still nascent. I, I definitely see it from the researcher perspective, and I think just be patient, I think it's going to take time. We've, we're essentially a whole generation of education to come. Well, that's great. I wanted to you know, thank the panelists, but I also wanted to make sure if anybody has any questions in the audience, we've got a couple minutes left. If there are any questions, we're happy to, to answer. It looks like there's one back there in the back. So, I mean, some of this, re some of this reminds me of a quote of a Nobel laureate years ago that says, discovery consists of seeing the same thing that everybody else sees, but thinking what nobody else thought. And <laughs> there's several indications of things coming out I wouldn't call them black swans, but they're the connection between two things that typically don't connect until someone's made the connection. Recently, for example, they found that inflammation may end up having a huge impact on depression and other kinds of mental health in illnesses, but they can't tell whether one causes the other or the other causes that. And it's a hot topic of debate right now, so when you come out of two totally different areas, and you're trying to synthesize the data that's being gathered from all of this kind of stuff. I mean, what are some thoughts about, I don't think it's just the numbers alone. I think it's the, the ability to actually even see that there's a possible connection. Yeah, go ahead, here. Yeah, I think it really, um, having multi, you know, multidisciplinary scientists work on problems, you know, I think there's sometimes uh, those, the big consortium projects get a lot of flack for you know, the number of people and the types of projects, but ha having different scientists of different background and training look at a problem um, and figure out how to approach it. And so on my team, we have population geneticists and computational scientists, people with CS backgrounds, people with population genetics backgrounds, working on problems together. And just that perspective really helps move the research along. Right. Yeah. So who's deciding the gold standard and how, how global is it? Are you crossing borders or especially in the multidisciplinary piece? So how often are these experts coming together to who, deciding the gold standards and then how do we access? Is there a, a website or a link that the everyday Joe can? Well, I mean, so again, there, I look at GA4GH as an interesting um, group that's pulling together meetings on a, at least twice a yearly basis that are public, you can, anyone can go. They do have an accessible board where you can become you know, a, a part of their kind of large board and giving guidance on how to move that forward. Um, there are other entities that do similar things to that, and so there isn't just one global standard. That's one of the things I think we're gonna run into over the next decade is there really isn't a global standard for ontologies or semantics to manage from a clinical data perspective. 
I think you heard the panel say, and it has happened, that we've really done a better job with on the, on the genomic side. We, I mean, we can get to the data, the VCF, we can get to that data, although it could be different coming out of different machines in different areas. But on the clinical data side has been the real challenge, I think, around what kind of standards. But GA4GH on the genomic side, as well as looking at clinical data, I think are doing some interesting things. If you want to check them out, I would definitely look into what, what they're doing and get involved in, in those uh, meetings. Any other suggestions of maybe meetings that you could think of? Not so much meeting, but just that w one answer to the question is the community does. So it's not one lab saying this is the best. That's right. It's a community that, that moves forward on the best that they think exists for them. Yep. Okay, please join me in thanking the panel for their 45 minutes of <laughs> interesting information.